Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com, thechrisvossshow.com. Hey, we're coming here with another great podcast. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Thanks for being here. To see the video version of this, go to youtube.com, Fortress Chris Voss. Hit that bell notification button. Go to all of our groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all those places the kids are playing at these days. We're over there. Also, go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Voss. See everything we're reading and reviewing over there as well. Today, we had an amazing author, actor, uh, I believe some of the other things I want to say on his thing is uh, producer and director from Hollywood. We have uh, Donald Long, <laughs> Donald Logue. Log on the show, Donald. My apologies, Donald Log. Oh the my show. God, it's Chris, no problem. I'm flipping it's screens fun. here between your IMDb and and yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, so Donald good. Log, we'll fix that in post. As they like to say in Hollywood. No need to. No need to. Okay. All right. Well, you know, part of the longer story of my life. It's all good. <laughs> A strange good. name, hard to pronounce. Donald Logue is with us on the show, and he was the co author of the book with Danny Treo. Treo, My Life of Crime, Redemption, and Hollywood. And uh, he co authored the book, uh, to my understanding, with uh, Danny Treo. And he's here with us today. Welcome to the show, Donald. How are you? Oh, Chris, I'm fantastic. Thank you. And thanks for um, having me. Thank you, you know? for coming. We right. certainly appreciate right. it. We've got, uh, you know, Hollywood royalty here between you and, and Danny and Spirit. Yeah, Danny is, uh, my God, Danny is um, the one in the zillion person, you know, and, and, and his story reflects that. And the book, I think, really gets to the heart of that really well. But, um, you know, I, I've been a very, you know, Danny and I have been very close friends for a long time. And, um, and this process of writing his book together only brought us closer. And, and actually I, I kind of, I love and admire the man, but it, it's made me love and admire him even more. There you go. There you go. Now, uh, give us your plug so people can find out about you and Danny on the interwebs or where to buy the book, whatever sort of plugging you yeah. want to put in for yourselves. You know, I mean, uh, if you go to simonandschuster.com, uh, that's where you can find Trejo, My Life of Crime, Redemption in Hollywood, or of course on Amazon or wherever, barnesandnoble.com. Um, you know, I'm I'm semi-active on social media at Donald F. Logue, um, at don't left logo on Instagram and Danny, you can find on official Danny Trejo, I think on Twitter and Instagram and, um, you know, but it, it, you know, luckily now the way books are, it's pretty easy to just Google search a book and find a way to, to get it. Although it'd be great for people to go in the stores and get it I, It was always a fantasy of mine to walk by a store, you know, or, or walk through the airport and see, a stack of Danny's books on the shelves and, and it's come to fruition. It's pretty wild. That is awesome. That is awesome, man. Now, Danny has been in over, I think it's over 400. He's acted in over 400 movies. Uh, <laughs> on 406 credits as of IMDb of today. You've acted in over 113 credits. And then you have a uh, producer, director, and a few other things to your credit. Do you, do you want to expand a bit, a little bit more on your bio and uh, feel free to, you know, you know, my, my uh, yeah, I guess my bio in regards to for the for Simon and Schuster was just, you know, I was born in Canada to Irish parents and grew up on the Mexican border, uh, studied history in college and fell into acting there. And then um, but writing was this thing that I'd always that's what I really wanted to do and um, have taken some stabs at it. And then but Danny's book was really it was just a. Uh, you know, this godsend because of course, Danny was so famous and ubiquitous and uh, there was real interest in his story of publishing houses. The problem was finding someone that he would trust enough to sit with him over the course of that kind of process. And really over the, you know, over the course of those hundreds and hundreds of hours of conversation really get to the, the third rail, the driving force that, that makes Danny who he is or some of the big epiphanies he's, he's had over the course of his life to either change his behavior or, you know, um, and that's what I think I was able to accomplish probably more so than a stranger would have been able to in the case with Danny. 
Yeah. And I, I had watched one of your guys' interviews where uh, Danny had said, you know, he was trying to get other people to write the book at first and, and, uh, he, he didn't hear his voice in them. And, and, and I think that's when you stepped in and saved him from that. Well, it's, it's really fascinating, Chris, the process of co-writing a memoir. Now, bear in mind that a lot of the memoirs that you see, um, the celebrity memoirs are generally speaking farmed out to somebody else because it's a lot, you know, the process of writing a book takes a long time. And what people do is they, they interview a subject. So they have their own voice, but at the same time, there's this completely different world where you have to build this whole world of prose and um, place their own words in context. And then within that, somehow start to try and really match their voice or in a way put yourself in their shoes and in their mind. And um, there's, there's kind of an art to it and it's, it's super difficult to find. But I think sometimes when you write, when you read a memoir, you can kind of either consciously or definitely subconsciously, you can tell when the voice, the narrative voice shifts and it doesn't quite feel like them, you know? Mm -hmm. And one thing that Danny and I did was at, during, you know, each draft of the book, I would sit and we would read the book out loud mm -hmm. and start to iron through stuff where he's like, nope, that's not how I felt in that situation. That's not, certainly not a word I would choose to use. And um, wow. so we were pretty painstaking about it. But, you know, I had to be, I, I think... I think in a weird way, when we pitched the book and there were a number of publishing houses interested, they were like, sure, we want a book from Danny Trejo, but who's his buddy? You know, like, <laughs> is this better, the long we... So I, I knew that hard work would be my only level of defense against, um, against uh, the people who were suspicious or potentially naysayers, you know? Mm -hmm. I know I know what that's like because I've I've handed over my book to the editors that I just got done doing. Oh, congrats. And there's that argument about what's that? Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh I guess if it ever gets published, you know, it'll be congrats. Um it will, but <laughs> um it's it's that that whole it's not your voice and then it's your voice and then it's not your, I'm like what whose voice is it supposed to be? Like I don't know, it's just maddening sometimes to do. Well, you know, it's it. and it's fascinating, <laughs> right? Because um it's the it's such an interesting thing, and I, I think this is funny, but definitely true. When I first started acting, the impetus was, you know, I was kind of a class clown and kind of a funny guy, I guess, a little bit, and had a certainly Irish colorful personality. And my friend said to me, you know, man, you'd probably do well at that. And then the second I had to memorize text and perform it, all of a sudden, every color I was able to generate in just my personal life, I felt like had been taken from me because of the artifice of memorization and delivery. And then I think it was Flannery O'Connor said, you know, everyone can tell a good story until they sit down to write one. Because <laughs> it's, it's remarkable, isn't it? When we generally sit down to write, all of a sudden, whether we think it has to be more formal or the voice doesn't come out like our conversational voice. Mm -hmm. And in a weird way with both acting and writing, it is this incredibly difficult process of beating away the fakeness that takes mm -hmm. us away from our natural voice and how to appear spontaneous when it's artifice and all these different things. But I mean, congrats on sitting down to write right. a book. I mean, clearly you're, a master at conversation and stuff. And so in a weird way, I think it's probably feels like it would be easy. And then all the, on the other hand, it feels like you're handcuffed. Yeah. Yeah. You're right? just like, you know, and, and the, the editing, Oh my God, the editor. So it was, it was great that you guys were able to sit down with Danny and, you know, really yeah. make this. And sound. by the way, had great editing Yeah, had yeah. Great help, and had, you know, it takes a team to come up with these things. You have mm -hmm. to have outside eyeballs, um, Michelle Herrera Mulligan at Atria Books and Simon and Schuster, uh, a dear friend of mine, Hillary Lifton, who's a genius writer and um, you know an author, an amazing author in her own right. And those were the women who really helped 
sit back and get some objective view of what we were doing. Sometimes I was just way too in the weeds. I had thousands of pages of things transcribed and written and it was overwhelming. I felt like I was drowning at certain parts in the process. Yeah. And then you guys had a lot of tapes too, right? You recorded a bunch of uh, interviews. Yeah, I, was, yeah, I would transcribe them and I'm not a great typist, but you know, I would come home at the end of the night and then I would spend hours just transcribing what we had had discussed. And then I remember it was so funny because there were times later when I was writing chapters and I would just kind of fill in what I was like, yeah, I think Danny said this. And when I went back to the actual transcript, he had said something different, but he had said something more brilliant than I ever could have concocted. And that's his mind. That's his unique, you know, he's a, he's a really brilliant, a deeply emotionally intelligent human being. So, yeah. Yeah, right. I'm and excited for people to read the books. You know? I'm excited too. He he's had quite the journey of life. So yeah. uh, I'm always surprised because I asked a bunch of people for questions today and uh, to come into the live show and watch. Um, and I, you know, there's still some people, and I think they're these millennials. You know those folks? I'm just, yes, I do. Uh, but you know, some are like, "Do Danny Trejo? Who's that?" And I'm like, did, "Did you ever see Heat? Like Machete?" Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, the Desperado. I mean, like, who who does, in my mind, who doesn't know who he is? But I actually found, like, a few people. Um, well, that's so, interesting. I mean, if you – but I do think that if you see his face – Yeah, I mean, you – All you, of a sudden, there's this – in fact, I think Danny's face is perhaps one of the most recognizable faces worldwide. Yeah. Which – and we discuss it in the book. It was this strange thing where, you know – Around the time of Machete, you know, there were these weird murals of Danny started popping up in places like, you know, Brazil and Germany and the Philippines. And um, his son Gilbert showed him a mural that someone had done of Danny in a, in in some in village in the Philippines. And I was like, wow, you if this is the next level, you're not just Danny Trejo, this guy who's come out of prison and had this movie career. You've seeped into some kind of collective psyche in some strange, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. he's super cool. So for those who are the layman of not knowing exactly who he was or putting the name to the face, yeah. uh, give us a, give us an arcing overview of the book and maybe so, a little bit of a uh, lay a foundation, if you would, of, of maybe Treo's uh, Danny's background, you know, he went okay. to prison, et cetera, et cetera. But for those who aren't too familiar. Absolutely. Um, and what I will say about the book is, and I think it's a great strength of the book is it doesn't, it's not really a Hollywood book. It's not talking mm. about Hollywood stories or, you know, it certainly gets into that part of his career. But what the book is, is about, we all have the ability to change in life, mm -hmm. that there's no situation in life as, as seemingly hope, hopeless as it appears that there is always hope as long as we're, we're breathing and we're living. And, you know, Danny was this guy, he wasn't one of the guys who fell through the cracks when he was young. He was in the space under the cracks, you know, he, he had it hard coming up, um, grew up in LA, grew up in a very kind of macho Chicanismo background, and then started getting in trouble and, you know, doing drugs at a really early age. The first time he really got busted and dragged down to juvie was like he was 10. Wow. First time he shot heroin, when he was 12. Wow. And, you know, and that was what he felt like you were supposed to do. And that's what, instead of like for, for some of us where it's like, okay, elementary school, junior high school, high school, college, career, whatever, they were like, oh, juvie, um, youth authority, fire camps, YTS, and the prison system, you know? Yeah. And um, there were a sort of certain set of rules he had been taught by this incredibly charismatic person in his life, his uncle Gilbert, who was only four years older than him, a really amazing, fascinating guy. And he's like, Danny, you're going to go to juvie, and this is what you have to do to survive wow. and thrive. And this is what's going to happen in prison. And um, because he had gone through those steps before him. And at some point after a massive prison riot in Soledad State Prison in 1968, where Danny was looking at a potential death penalty charge for apparently attacking a guard, um, that's when all of those rules, that tough guy stuff, how to survive, how to how to never show fear, how to never step back. That's when all of that stuff abandoned him and he wow. needed something else. 
And what he found was God. Wow. And it's how the spiritual life, a spiritual life and a life of helping other people. If you want help in life, help someone else. Boom. Mm -hmm. Stop. Full stop. And so he just said, God, if you get me out of this, if you if you let me live, I'll say your name every day and I'll help an inmate every day. And he said inmate because he never assumed he'd get out of prison, but he did. And he kept helping people. And it wasn't until, you know, many years, almost 17 years after he got out of prison. So he was already in his early 40s when his film career started. Yeah. And as this bit player who was like inmate number one or Chicano number two, or, you know, in his mind, he was excited. And this friend of his who owned um, a string of methadone clinics, because he's like, Danny, can you imagine if people see your face out there, it might help spread in some way, the message of recovery and hope. And then Danny's always seen his career as an extension of this megaphone he's been given to tell his life story and essentially that life story is to help, let's help each other. Um, you know, that there's a way out of whatever it is, the addiction or the addiction of loved ones, how we, to deal with that. Um, he had a lot of failed marriages and a string of broken relationships. And it took him till very late in his life to have some kind of insight on why that might be the case in his life and how he could grow from that. And you know, it's, it's a, you know, I think it's a really triumphant story of personal growth. Most definitely. So how did, did the two of you meet? This is an interesting story, I think. You know, I was a janitor at this uh, place called the West Hollywood Drug and Alcohol Center back in 1991. And Danny came in and it was a crazy place. They'd have midnight meetings, a lot of fights, a lot of raucousness. And um, Danny remembers me as being like the angriest dude he'd ever met. <laughs> In and he's my, the guy from prison. Right. And in my defense, I was like, look, man, I was trying to, I was trying to corral that place in and there was, it was, it was ridiculous. Um, the drama going on, but eight years later, Danny and I met on the set of reindeer games, mm. a movie that John Frankenheimer directed with Charlize Theron and Ben Affleck and Gary Sinise and, uh, really amazing experience. And we were up way, we were up in Prince George, British Columbia, which is up near kind of Alaska in Canada. And, um, we met one night in a snowy church basement. The first night I was there and I was going through some stuff. My first, my oldest boy was like five days old at the time. And it was hard to take the job, but I had to take the job. I felt like I was stuck between rocks and a hard place. And Danny, uh, Danny was like, I got your back, partner, you know, and he has had it ever since. Wow. You know, wow. so we became really good friends there up in up in Prince George. That's uh, pretty amazing. Life. And then you I had overheard you say tell a story about how, uh, you know, he spends a lot of time going out and speaking to youth, uh, troubled youth, people oh who God, need help yeah. and stuff. Yeah. And he, even yesterday, last night, I was at his house and he's like, hey, man, you want to come to Palm Springs with me? I'm speaking to these people on Friday and wow. Saturday and every single night. And whether it's uh, 50,000 people at a recovery convention that's being beamed worldwide or the next night to nine children who are in a halfway home, that's what he does every day. Wow. That is he shares the story, you know, and, and, and this is, Chris, what you're doing with your show what books are doing, what we're trying to do with TV and film. Yeah, on one hand, they're goofy entertainment or sometimes they're mindless. But at other times, it's in sharing stories and in listening to someone else's story where we gain that perspective on our own. And it really makes us think about our life. And, you know, it's there's kind of a deeper reason why humans have been doing this, you know, around a fire in a cave forever. And, uh, um, and, you know, I, I, I know I was certainly impacted by a lot of people's stories that I've been able to hear, um, and especially the ones where they share their insecurities and their frailties and the foibles and the stuff and the vulnerabilities that make us human, you know. And one thing that's what's beautiful about Danny's story is that Danny was friends with this guy, Eddie Bunker, in prison. And Eddie Bunker was the captain's clerk in San Quentin. He was like the most powerful inmate in the prison. He he no one knew prison politics better. He was a genius. He he used to what he used to do was um, he was an architect of crimes. Like he would 
draw up plans for robberies and sell them and then take his third call. You know what I wow. mean? Other stuff. And Eddie what was became a very successful prison novelist. And when he got out, he was the one who had adapted the screenplay for Runaway Train, the John Voight movie mm -hmm. that was Danny's first break. And um, Eddie told Danny about someone else's book. There was someone who they all knew in the community. He was kind of a tough guy, had done some time, and he wrote a book. And Eddie said about it, he goes, badass, badass, too afraid to show his ass. Mm -hmm. You know, so when, you, when you're like, when you hear someone talking, it's just like, I'm the toughest guy and I'm the baddest this and I'm the, and I had no fear and this and that. Immediately, there's something in me that starts to shut down because I'm like, there's kind of a BS factor going on. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, come on, dude. We're all scared at times, you know? Yeah. And it, it's what's, it's that thing, that vulnerability that, that joins us and allows us in. And um, so Danny was not a, he wasn't afraid to be vulnerable especially yeah. in, this, in this book. And I mean, he's got that character face. I, you know, that was one of the things I learned in yeah. Hollywood, the, the character face and it's just epic. I mean, his, his, his face can, he doesn't have to say anything. His face can tell yeah. you a story just, just looking at his face yeah. and you, you go, that guy has led a hard life and he's been somewhere. Yeah. You know, it's funny. So I was at his house last night. And it was Danny and this friend of his, Mario Castillo, who he met when Mario was an inmate in San Quentin and Danny was doing blood in, blood out there. And after a few more stints in prison, Mario got out and got itself together. He helps other, he helps other ex-cons kind of find their way and stuff. He's the greatest guy with the best stories. And we were watching some documentary on one of those true crime things. And they were like, you know, the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas, you know, they're doing one of those wow. real prison gang things. And I'm sitting there and these two men who are so awesome and hilarious and they're laughing. And I go, God, you know, it's so weird when I watch these things that I, I forget that that was your life for so many decades mm -hmm. for the both of them. Right. That was the, the world that they were in and, uh, and thank God they got to the other side and it's certainly not easy to, but he has that face because he's earned it. Yeah. You yeah. can't, uh, but you know, Danny has, he's the, he's the, he has the best laugh. He's got the best smile. Um, he lights up a room, you know, and you forget that he has that side to him that was absolutely terrifying. Oh yeah. I mean, he, on, on screen, he looks your way with that with that look, and yeah. you you just you, oh, I'm going to yeah. run away. I'm going to run he, out of I don't theater. I think he has a word in uh, Desperado. <laughs> yeah, I think Robert Rodriguez just said, "I don't need you to speak, man. I just need you to look." Yeah, just like a badass. But I'm like I told you about pre-show. I met him in 2003, 2004, something like that. 2005. Yeah. Uh, nicest guy in the world. So yeah, he, everybody's going up to him, wanted pictures with him, and yeah. wanted to meet him, and. He, he just couldn't, he couldn't be more of a genteel, uh, just nice yeah. guy, just all around. I mean, and, uh, but I, I would never want to piss him off. <laughs> so, 100%, absolutely. Yeah. So what are some other aspects or things or things you can tease about that are in the book that you think readers will, will be enticed by? You know, I think, um, for fans of Danny's, it's that, that journey that he made from just being kind of that inmate number one guy, the guy mm -hmm. who had, you know, and, and how he got from that to being with Machete, which at the time, I, I'm trying to remember, but I think Danny was almost in his mid-60s. Yeah. But here's a guy in his mid-60s who's the romantic action lead <laughs> of a major – studio release and it's the first time it's happened it breaks every paradigm and it's again a one in a zillion story you know but more I, I think for the book with me it's um you know it, it's just that journey of this uh, of a he's 77 years old is he wow he's lived a lot of life and it's that journey of something that we'll all relate to a tough upbringing yeah. you know some problems at home, some stuff that happens when you're a kid that haunts you for the rest of your life, that somehow determines your behavior. This idea sometimes that we carry that we've been um, victimized by another person or things were unfair. And um, 
you know, and that realization that sometimes when we're children, uh, the adults, they're not, they're not necessarily doing stuff to hurt us. They're just trying to survive themselves and to have that full breadth of perspective. And I think the book has something in a weird way for everybody, you know, for fans of Danny's, for people who aren't, what I love about the book is, yeah, there are some people who don't know who Danny Trejo is. And some of them were kind of from the more genteel classes of um, more the fans of New Yorker and stuff like that. And what I loved was that um, some of the people involved in the publishing of the book, they were like, oh, you know, my husband who's, you know, he's a big Joyce fanatic or something. He had, doesn't watch movies and he read the manuscript and he flipped out about it. And I'm like, man, I, that's who, you know, I think casual movie fans. And I think, um, but I also think for the Latin community that here's a voice this guy was born literally of an affair in the middle of the Zoot Suit riots, oh, wow. in the birth of the Chicano movement in the United States, and became arguably the most famous Chicano of all time. And he traces that journey and what it's like to be proud of his heritage, but incredibly patriotic about the country that he lives in. And um, he loves America. And, you know, and only in America could there be a Danny Trejo. And uh, and I, I just, um, you know, what I love, too, is some of my kids' friends who are not readers at all, which was weird. When I grew up, I was a crazy reader. But they've picked up the book because it's been lying around my house, and they won't give it back, you know. Oh. That, that excites me because, you know, there are certain people who are going to read whatever books come out and come out on the New York Times bestseller list, which thankfully, you know, Danny's did immediately. And um, and then there are people who, for some reason, reading just isn't their bag. But I, I really feel like if they crack this one open, it's going to be hard for them to put down. Yeah. I mean, how did you guys decide on what stories to keep? Because I imagine, I mean, he must have like a uh, billions of books worth of stories yeah, that, that was tough and it was tough to um it was tough for some babies to kind of get thrown out with the bathwater. but ultimately there's there's a kind of group of stories that you know serve the central thematic move of the story there's a story and good stories have this flow and sometimes even if you're sitting on a bar stool you realize that you're listening to someone and you're like, all right, dude, you're floating away from a tangent and I want to get back to what happened over here. And um, that was the thing that we, that was the criteria that we used to decide, you know, what kind of st stayed and what went. Yeah. You know how you go through those times where you see something you and like, uh, and you always wanted to see it, but you didn't know that you always want to see it. But the moment yeah. you see it, the moment you go, oh my God, that's it. Uh, I grew up as a kid walking the dog with Bob Barker, and the first time I saw him Holy fight smokes. what's his face in the movie, uh, what, what was that? Uh, that's Holy Smokes! I said, "Wow!" Yeah. Now, as a kid, we lived uh, uh, on the corner from where his uh, house is. There, with the uh, it's the first uh, Adobe home in uh, what you call it. My parents rented uh, or they didn't rent apartments; they managed apartments right next to him. So we'd walk the dog, and I'd sit and look at him and go, "Like, how does he get in that TV every day?" But when he fought uh, Adam Sandler in the movie, I think Happy Gilmore, Happy Gilmore, yeah. I didn't know that I never wanted to see him fight, but seeing him kick Adam Sandler's butt was. That was all like right then there's money. So what I'm getting to is, is I was watching the, the Quentin Tarantino film, a uh, grindhouse, I think it was. And they show yeah. that ad scene where he comes out as, as machete. And I was just like, I will pay to see that movie. I don't care. Yeah, that's I will a, that's go. In the book, Chris, that's awesome. Because when they, <laughs> you know, what happened with machete was that when they were doing Desperado, the wheels were turning and, in Robert Rodriguez's head. And then he mentioned to Danny, I have this idea for this. Why can't there be like this Mexican James Bond, Batman kind of guy, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and then he didn't know where he could do it or how he could get the support to do it. But when he and when Quentin and R Robert were doing grindhouse, Robert said, I have this incredible trailer in mind for this, <laughs> exploitation movie called Machete. And when they showed it at the 
Grindhouse premiere, the whole audience went nuts. Oh yeah. For the Machete trailer. And that's when Robert turned to Danny and nodded because he said, now we have our movie. This is the only thing we needed. And like he had that response that you had. Yeah. I mean, I, I was just floored. I'm like, please, you have to make this movie. I'll, I'll buy two, three, four, I'll buy a thousand oh. bucks to see this movie. I mean, it just it just was like so perfect for him. Uh, you know, m- my favorite movie in the whole wide world is Heat. And yeah. uh, and I got to tell you, to this day, I have trouble watching the scene where uh, Danny, you know, dies and, and Robert De Niro uh, yeah. takes him out of his misery. Yeah. But but uh, to this day, I, I'm always so upset because he's taken out of the movie. And I'm always like, Damn it! I wanted I wanted the rest of the movie to be with him in there. Yeah, it's so <laughs> intense because he gets you know they have his Anna or whatever you yeah. know like uh, that's the only death scene that um, Danny's ever done that his daughter just couldn't wow watch. Yeah, it's you know she to went to her room and she was so upset because they were watching Heat together. And she went to her room and he goes, it's okay, baby. I'm here. You know, and she goes, you know, he goes, you know, cause she'd seen him die in so many films. He's died more than he's died more than any other actor in Hollywood history. And she said, dad, this one was so real because that was the life you led. Danny wasn't cast in heat because he was as an actor necessarily. He was on heat with Eddie Bunker as armed robbery consultants. Oh, wow. And then Michael Mann, had done this incredible movie called the Jericho mile with Peter Strauss about a Mm -hmm. guy who breaks the world record in the mile in prison um, or qualifies for the Olympics. And uh, it's amazing movie, but to film the movie in Folsom, he needed the, he had the cooperation of white and black inmates, but not the Mexicans. And he had to talk to the syndicate of which Gilbert Trejo's Danny's uncle was one of the leading members. And so they worked out a deal. And so later, Michael Mann was like, he saw him and he was like, Gilbert. And he goes, no, 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 no. That's my uncle, you know? And Danny had worked with Michael Mann before, but Michael hadn't remembered this from the Camarena story. And uh, so then he started, you know, the character that Danny played and he wasn't this Mexican guy or anything like it, but Michael immediately changed it to be Danny. And he said, Danny, I have to call it Gilbert Trejo. And he goes, well, that's the biggest honor you could ever bestow upon me, you know? So Danny plays his uncle Gilbert Trejo in that movie. And yeah. And the death scene's pretty intense. Dude, it's, it's, it's really intense. And I, I, to this day, I'm still bummed out. I'm like, well, I should just turn yeah. the movie off now. It makes the movie no so uh, emotional though. You know, it needed that. It in does. That it takes it away yeah. from you. It's kind of that takeaway sales reverse psychology thing where it goes, 100%. Uh, take this away. And he was one of the most likable guys of the crew. I mean, the other guys are, they are good actors, but you know, some of their seedy characterness and stuff. I mean, I like Danny the best. He was, he was the straight guy. He's like the honorable loyal guy. You know, he's got all this. Yeah. Anyway, we could talk forever about he, he, um, he actually, <laughs> I did talk forever about it. Cause there's this podcast out of Australia that's dedicated to heat, which is pretty amazing. Is uh-huh. it really? Wow. Yeah, but he is – what a movie, you know, what yeah. a film. I could get into the nitty-gritty of Heat for a long time, but I, I auditioned for Michael Mann once, and we auditioned for – it was just me and him in his office, and it was like three and a half hours. It's so really? intense. I ended wow. up not doing the project, but um, I was like, wow, I've never – this guy is so precise in what he wants and what he does. Like, it's just a next level, and all the details and heat kind of show it, you they know. definitely do. One they of the great do. heist movies of all time, and I would say with uh, To Live and Die in L.A. and then the older ones yeah. like Sunset Boulevard, but just – and like Danny's book in a weird way, for people who love – I have this love affair with Los Angeles for a zillion reasons. And by the way, I came here, clearly I was a janitor at the drug and alcohol center. So things weren't really rolling my way. But what I did find about LA was it had this heart to it. That's so different from what people think Mm -hmm. because there's a lot of life and humanity going on here besides the entertainment industry. But, um, you know, heat's one of the great LA movies of all time. Yeah, it is. It's just, it just really is. Um, it, it, just such a wonderful story and life of redemption with him. Uh, and both of you actually from some of the journeys that you've been on, uh, anything more you want to tease out on the book, uh, to get people to pick that baby up? I, you know, I just think, um, 
I, it, it feels weird because it feels like you do a shuck and jive soft shoe dance. You know, I, I don't, the book is really good. Um, mm. And I love that. And it's not that it is the most important thing in the world, but it was awesome to get incredibly nice critical reviews because they're coming at it critically, you know? And then, uh, and I think in a way it tells readers that you're not going to dive into something that's like wham, wham, a slog fest. Mm -hmm. This guy's life is 7,000 times more interesting, <laughs> fascinating, um, illuminating, and inspiring than any movie or, or television show that Danny's ever done. And that's guaranteed. Could this be a movie but i mean who would pay who would play danny no one could play danny i mean like yeah i don't know, I don't know man well first of all, no one could play danny but absolutely yeah it, it, i think it would have to be a multi it would have to be a a series you know it would have yeah. to be some kind of 13 episode arc but um i'd pay to see that i mean you have to get a good actor it's some, it's, i i don't know how you'd match that caliber you know Maybe you'd have, have to play you'd have to get a young you'd have to get the young guys too you'd have to get them as children and as as teenagers and stuff like that, which is always interesting. But you know, what I do love about a book that's transportive in a way that films and stuff can't always be, um, is that it contains those multitudes of worlds in this simple little package. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to making movies and stuff, now you're talking about a $160 million budget and a zillion 18 wheelers filled with equipment. You know, what's beautiful about this story in this book is that you don't need any of those to to have that ride. It's mm -hmm. right there at your fingertips, you know, and just yesterday we're getting news like more territories around the world are buying it. And um, I'm just I can't believe that you're going to go somewhere and it's going to be translated into German and Japanese. And, you know, um, I just love that. Like, I love that. And I was so proud that I was able to be part of bringing that story to life, you know, and for me personally, yeah, I've done a bunch of, um, uh, I've done a bunch of film and television and, uh, I I'm really proud of that. I'm proud of the projects that I was involved in. And then I'm really proud of this because that was my contribution to the written word. And, um, you know, and, uh, and I've been so lucky to be, you know, to be like some of my favorite projects when I was a young actor, um, Common Ground, Gettysburg, and the band played on, they were all stories based on Pulitzer Prize winning books that mm -hmm. were brought to life. And um, that's where I felt like, wow, if I have an ability to inhabit a character, or bring some of this person's story to light and help this story to be brought to a broader audience, you know, because if you're not a reader, um, I would say if you are a reader, the Killer Angels and the band played on and the band played on and um, Common Grounder, these books that just I love that kind of stuff. I love I love historical nonfiction or even historical fiction. I like knowing. And when I do a Civil War movie or a Revolutionary War movie or something, it's just an excuse for me to go out and read 20 books about it to understand it more, too help myself understand it more. And so, um, you know, I've been actively engaged in storytelling in one way or another. Uh, I have, uh, other pursuits. I, I became a long, I, I, be, I got my CDL and became a long haul trucker, oh, wow. uh, 11 years ago. I, I have this little trucking company called Ashley and we have truck driving schools up in Oregon called Ashley truck Academy. I have a hardwood company with this partner of mine, Kevin Frizen, Frizen Low Hardwoods. So if you guys, if people out there want to buy like uh, walnut slabs or oak or <laughs> blue stain pine or something, we have a mill and a kiln up in Oregon that I'm super involved in. And uh, I just think, uh, you know, I hope with my kids that part of it is that they look at me and say, you know, well, here's a dude who didn't stop moving his feet. And it's possible, you know, to write books and drive trucks and do different stuff. And you don't always have to be the best at it, but you got to try. And, um, you know, uh, there's a lot to get done on planet Earth. And, uh, you know, but man, I'm just I'm just blown away by the fact that this book, you know, and I know that you know this, Chris, being involved in the process yourself. Like it's one thing to find a publishing house 
and an editor who's willing to take it on. And, uh, and then books, the 30,000 books, excuse me, 30,000 books a month come out. And, um, you know, and they, it, it's, it's a brutal business to want to be a writer or an actor, all these different things. I mean, the rewards are nice, but sometimes hard to come by, but, um, that this book is going to be in airports yeah. when you're walking by and someone on a flight from, uh, you know, Dallas to New York is going to be like, Hmm, that guy's story. That's interesting. And to think that we had something to do with just filling their flight and making them think about their own life. Like that's the coolest thing in the world. That is. So when do we get your book on your life? Oh, I don't know, man. <laughs> you know, my, oh. agent is, my agent's like, all right, get busy. Um, <laughs> You know, so, so but, was the proponent for this book COVID giving you guys some time off to you could work well, COVID on COVID certainly no, we started it before that, but COVID came in. It was kind of like it was amazing in this weird way where it was like, okay, nothing else going on, you know, nothing. Well, I, I did do some filming during COVID, which was interesting. Um, but we had these months where we were both just kind of like you know, we were in our bubble and, uh, yeah, COVID definitely provided this, this, uh, kind of laboratory for us to just get busy with it and have no excuses. Yeah. I had an idea, you know, what you could do, you could do a Martin Scorsese's the Irishman, that whole camera thing they did. Maybe we could just take Danny and, you know, just do this to go, go to younger and older. And I don't know it did. I don't think it turned out very well on the Irishman. That's my opinion. <laughs> Uh, the Irishman, yeah. I mean, look, I, I'm loath to say anything because every sure, yeah. Scorsese's movies and um, what a genius, you know, what a yeah. genius. But yeah, that's a tough one. That's a yeah. tough one when you're like, I, I know it myself because I did a sitcom called Grounded for Life and we were, so at the time I must have been 33 or whatever it was and I had my own kids and then we would do these high school flashbacks and there's just like, ugh. Yeah. Dude, no one wants to see me pretending to be an 18 year old version yeah. of me. It's just painful. Yeah. And I think uh, it was Al Pacino's or Robert De Niro's way too blue eyes that were throwing, that it was taking me right. It was like breaking the fourth wall. It was taking me right yeah. out of it. You know, what's interesting because my initial response to the, to the Irishman was that was jarring me right off the bat. But I have to say that as the movie wore on, I got, um, I got down with it, you know, yeah. For me, the one scene that was interesting was, you know, he comes home and he goes down the street, De Niro, and beats the hell out of a grocer. Um, I think it was for what he did to his daughter or something in the yeah. shop. But I thought about Robert De Niro as, you know, when he was in Mean Streets and it was young De Niro or something, there was nobody who did that physical, violent, jamming, acting better. And then you could just see, hey, look, man. <laughs> We all get older and getting old is great in some ways and sucks in others. Yeah, it sucks a lot of ways for me. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there you go. Uh, what do you think? My, my sister always says getting old isn't for, um, it's rhymes with wussies, which I think is, <laughs> which is true. You know, it's like, it is tough to get old. I, I like to say youth is wasted on the young Yep. Um, and then George Carlin used to do a bit where he said, you know, it's really screwed up how this works. You should start out old and then you have money and then you work your way up to being young. It should, it should go the other way, you know? So. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, what are, What is something or maybe some things that you think readers are going to take away that they don't know about Danny that they. I don't know if they knew book. about the extent of how um, intense his criminal life was. Mm -hmm. uh, it gives them some insight. I always think that a good, I always think prison memoirs are kind of fascinating. We clearly have a bit of a fascination with them as a society because people can't, people love watching true crime and those locked up documentaries, but there's different stages to the book. And, um, you know, what someone wrote was they were just psyched. It wasn't just this kind of weird, goofy Hollywood tell all that it was getting into the nitty gritty of that and prison politics and 
um, the mindset you have to have. And I think that was fascinating because it certainly tore back a curtain on stuff that I didn't know. I wouldn't have known intuitively. And um, that, you know, that it's fascinating. Again, um, what I do think is, is that I, I think its greatest strength and value is in that golden rule. And I don't care how tough you are or where you're from or what neighborhood you're in or whatever. If you want help in life and if you're hurting, the answer is to help someone else. Yeah. And in that and it's not to be goofy or like, look at God, I'm being a nice guy or whatever. It's like, actually, that's the thing that takes you out of your own head and puts you in motion. And like Danny says, everything good that's ever happened to him came as a direct result for helping someone else without expecting anything in return. Yeah. And that's happened to me in my own life. If I stop and help someone change a tire or push a car to the side of the road, you know, that's because my dad and my mom taught me that that's what we do. You know, yeah. I give them full credit. But as time went on in, in my own small corner of the universe, I guarantee I, I would go to job interviews, auditions in Hollywood, and someone would say, Hey, look, man, eight years ago you pushed my you helped my mom out when her car stalled out on Gower. Wow. You know, and it's like I didn't do it because 10 years later I was gonna meet some producer in a meeting, but I guarantee you, like. You never know action begets action. If you get off your ass and leave the house and do stuff and positive things, positive things are going to come back to you. Danny's living proof of that. His yeah. story. Um, and I think like all stories, it should inspire us to look at our own lives in a certain way. And it's entertaining as hell. It's a great read, you know, and uh, it's, um, you know, I hate it, It's so hard to say that because it's so self-aggrandizing and self-serving, but it's, it was really like, Hey, help me be a vessel, you know, help me just help transpose this guy's story to a wider audience, because mm -hmm. I think um, people will find benefit and value in it in their own life. So, you know, um, but they're going to have to read the book too, to, to yeah. get to that, you know, can't give everything away. There are no spoilers. There's no, uh, there's no plot to kill the president or some crazy shit in there. <laughs> Dirt it. Dirt it. Black four. Yeah. The, uh, you know, it's it, the story of redemption, the story about sharing, helping other people. I love that his life, he goes around and spends time with people that are struggling with addiction and other different issues. Uh, back when coronavirus started, I was crushed because I just watched all this money disappear that was planned out. You, you may have been in a similar situation in Hollywood where projects came screeching to a halt that were planned. And, and I was just like, I mean, I was just, I was just crushed. And I saw the, the 2008 recession that I went through and a friend of mine wrote on Facebook, he goes, there's two things you do right now, find a lifter or be a lifter. And I didn't feel like lifting at that point, but I said, Okay, so what do I have? What are my assets? I have a podcast. I have a big, pretty big audience. Uh, I have a lot of social media influence and stuff. What can I do with this? I'm going to be a lifter. And it was hard for about four or five episodes where I was, you know, trying to be a lifter and it wasn't working out pretty good. You know, and I was cracking up, but I kept doing it and, um, and I became a lifter. And so giving back to people, helping them and, and stuff, sometimes that are, man, when bottoms, you need something, when you need something, it's the hardest thing, right? Because mm -hmm. you're trembling. Danny got out of prison. He was 25 years old. He had this, imagine 19, 1969, no one had a friggin' tattoo like Danny on his chest. <laughs> that was a prison resume writ large for anyone to see. He comes back to his house like a little boy and he needs to stay there. And his dad doesn't even want to let him in the screen wow. door. You know, and he sits on the bed and he's so full of this rage and he goes, he takes his shirt off and he sits across from his dad, this super tough guy who was tough, you know, just tough love and probably scared of what the road Danny was heading down and headed down. And Danny had his shirt off because he knew it would piss this man off. <laughs> and they were like two of the angriest mofos sitting in a living room with plastic on the furniture, you know, <laughs> that's it. I can see and his this. mom was like, can I, can I get you milk and cookies, you know? And his dad's like, yeah. 
So these two super angry dudes are eating milk and cookies. And Danny's like, what the, who the F am I, man? You know, I'm like this 12 year old kid who they didn't even like anyway. I'm 25. No one's going to hire me with my record, you know, and that was going to follow him everywhere. And he went outside and there was an old lady um, struggling to carry. Back then they used to have this, they didn't have normal trash cans. They had these big like containers or whatever. And she was, there was construction and she was struggling to carry these things. And Danny started ru running towards her. And she was like, no me robes, you know, don't rob me. They all knew Danny's reputation. He goes, I ain't going to rob you. I'm helping you. And he was so, you know, and he, and he pulled her trash cans and he started, um, he started dragging these trash cans for the old people out when their trash was getting picked up because it got him out of his head. Mm -hmm. So while sitting in that house going, I'm a piece of crap. They don't like me. This is this. You're going like you're living in the future where you're like, I'm never going to get a job. I'm an ex-con. You're living in the past. You're like, I have all this regret of all these people I burned and robbed people who are going to be out here, people whose family are going to be around pissed off at me still. And what you do is you go help someone else and does it help them? Sure. But who it helps mostly is yourself because you're yeah. not sitting there on a couch, <laughs> hating yourself, living in either the future or the past, both of which you have no control over. It's mm -hmm. done. It hasn't happened yet, you know? And so, um, that's what Danny did, you know? And there's another really awesome story in the book where there was no lady on Danny's block. And Danny started because he couldn't get a normal job. He started a landscaping com company with this other ex-con named Danny mm -hmm. and D and D landscaping. And so they were mowing lawns. And so there was an old lady in his neighborhood who, you know, really unkempt hair kids called her the witch, her grass, her, everything was completely overgrown. She had the one shit house on the neighborhood that was nice or, you know, and, um, Danny knew that her son had been killed in gang style stuff. Wow. Her other son had died in Vietnam and her husband had committed suicide over grief. And he was like an alcoholic. So Danny said to his friend, Danny, he goes, Hey man, we're going to do this lawn. Right. And for free. And they didn't even knock on the door. They would just, they just started mowing her lawn every week and clipping her hedges. Wow. You know, and at some point, like the third or fourth time, he notices that someone's peeking out at the curtain <laughs> to him. All right. They don't do anything. They just do it. And so one day, probably two months into this, the door opens on the back porch and um, Danny hears something and he comes around and he sees that there's this big pitcher of lemonade in like a Waterford crystal thing, you know? Wow. Pitch, and then there are these two crystal glasses, like wow. killer crystal with ice in them, right? And what Danny had never told anyone ever that one of his biggest fantasies in life back when he was doing armed robberies and stuff was he was going to pull some big super heist. He was going to get some fat money. He was going to go to Las Vegas. And his fantasy was sitting in a club with broads all over him, drinking whiskey out of a crystal glass because he'd never – had a drink and from crystal before wow. and hear the ice cubes clinking in crystal. And wow. when sitting on that lady's porch with Danny Levitoff, drinking this crystal, this lemonade that tasted better than anything ever could any whiskey. He was like, isn't God funny the way he makes your dreams come true, but in a way different than you thought they would be and better and better. And That's better, amazing. you know, and the, his life story is kind of full of that stuff. And um, wow. yeah, that's in the book. So if you get to the book and another thing, this old guy came down the street when they were doing the ladies lawn. And he was like, hey, Paco, how much do you charge for the lawn? And Danny was pissed because he knew it was some BS, some big old white guy who's, you know, racist or something. And he goes, we don't charge her nothing. And God thinks about it. And he goes. Um, hey, follow me. You know, Danny follows him and he opens up. He's got a really manicured place and a garage and stuff like that. And he says, uh, if you help me with my lawn, my wife won't let me mow the lawn anymore because I had a heart attack last year. Um, 
he goes, I'll give you all this equipment. And what he didn't know was Danny and the D and D landscaping needed a new lawnmower, an edger and clippers and all that kind of stuff. And this guy gave it to them. Wow. And that was God too. And he had just, and the only reason he did was because he had asked that question, how much do you charge the old lady to, <laughs> to do her lawn? And Danny said nothing. And he knew in that moment, that's that kind of stuff. You know, yeah. I'm not yeah. saying do good stuff because there are going to be cash prizes waiting for you, but don't be surprised if there are. The serendipity of those moments are just amazing, extraordinary. Yeah. Where sometimes putting yourself in the path of, of just the universe or God or whatever you want to call it, yeah. you know, it's, it's the universe and God, right? You pick. You know, I used to say to my friend Chris, I was like, hey, man, I have problems. You know, I was raised with religion and it's like there's hypocrisy and this and that. And he goes, who hung the moon, dude? Not these not these dudes you're talking about, you know, go stand in front of a in front of a 10 foot wave. Who wins? You know, and I was like, oh, OK, I, I'm starting to get it, <laughs> you know, like. And I'm not putting down religion because I think religion is phenomenal, especially all this, you know, love your neighbor and mm -hmm. uh, as yourself and be good to each other. That's so important. And so, um, you know, I, I, I just think that uh, a spiritual contemplative life is important, but certainly one where you take action because, you know, faith without works is nothing. Right. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. Um, so it's been wonderful to have you on the show. Anything more you want to tease out on the book before we go? No, oh, man. You know, the book's the book. It's available everywhere that books are sold. Um, the, I have some stuff coming out. I have a on the Peacock. I have a mini series season two of a show called Departure. Oh, wow. Um, about a train derailment that with Archie Punjabi is really awesome. And um, uh, Resident Evil, I did a remake of that you know, there's a reboot of that franchise and uh, that's going to come out this, this fall. And uh, a couple of uh, a movie called all my puny sorrows is going to premiere at the Toronto film festival. So I was lucky to stay busy and get some filming done during COVID. We had to be careful, but I, I, I don't say that necessarily as much for myself. I, I just think um, in the case of TJ Scott, who did departure and Johannes Roberts, who did, um, Resident Evil and Mike McGowan, who did all my puny sorrows and the amazing cast in it. I'm excited for some of these things to be shown to people because they're, you know, all my puny sorrows is depressing subject matter, but told in such a beautiful way. Resident Evil is one of those old school, just fun as hell, thrill ride zombie things, you know? And, um, <laughs> and I like that. I like peppering. You know, I've been lucky to have pepper my career with things like, you know, from Blade to Zodiac or or sitcoms or, you know, Grounded for Life and um, or Gotham mm -hmm. or Vikings or whatever. And it's been it's just uh, it, it's fun to still be included at the table. What's you know? your favorite role that you played? Uh, um movie or scene terriers i think the tv series terriers i did for fx mm -hmm. i have kind of a one and out but awesome adored kind of critical one and out season terriers on fx which is on hulu is absolutely if someone's like what do you do as an actor i'd say look if you're willing to take the time and you want to give me 13 hours watch that 13 episodes and you decide at the end of it and let it give it three to get into it. And then Jimmy, the cab driver, the improv comedy sketches I used to do for MTV in the 90s. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. wow you know, there you go. I did all their crazy uh, comedy stuff back in that kind of height of the old awesome MTV days. And it really felt like my best friends, Clay Tarver and Jesse Parrots and I were like three guys who got to make up the rules. No adults allowed. We filmed it ourselves, you know, I improv them. And so I was proud of that because it was the first time I feel like when you're an actor, you get, oh yeah, yeah. You get to come in and sit down and you hope to give them the best version of what their vision is, but there's, you have so little control over everything and you shouldn't, it's not your show, but yeah. when it's your show, you get a chance to make it the way you want to. And that was Jimmy, the cab driver. 
That's awesome. We'll have to check that out. Uh, when I had my uh, talent agency uh, back around the time Danny was there, I would get to go to a few different uh, auditions. And I would see the difference between, you know, people that would come up and do auditions that, you know, there was no, you know, nothing there. You'd just be like, yeah, but and then someone would come up and they would just punch it, kill it and deliver. And you would just, you'd be crying and there's no scene background. There's no, there's no setup yeah. or anything. They're just standing there, just making hey, it. For all cry. young actors out there too, a scene isn't just saying the words. It's how you yeah. walk. A scene starts like you can walk in the door of a house 700 different ways. You know, like animals don't like dogs in a dog park. They don't need to have dialogue with each other for them to be like, stay F away from me. Or I kind of like you, you know, and we as humans can do that. And good actors, man, they have that ability, right, to change the molecules of the air in the yeah. room and just that energy that they bring to it. And um, yeah, I love that. There's a scene in this movie, An Angel at My Table, one of my favorite movies, and they're this woman's brother, they're in, they're in New Zealand and kind of a period thing. And uh, they're auditioning for the school theatrical and he's a little kid. And, you know, one kid comes out and he's like, look out, look out, dynamite. And someone else is like, look out, dynamite. And then this one kid, their brother comes out and just look out, look out, dynamite. And he blows it. He's committed. And you're like, oh, shoot, that's it. Yeah. It's commitment. Yeah. If you're half-assed about it, don't be surprised when someone's half-assed experiencing it. Yeah. I feel really blessed because I really love film and, and actors and what they do, actresses and what they do. Uh, in fact, I hadn't watched Lady from Shanghai, but from Orson Welles. I, I don't know why. I just never had. The I have I was, You haven't? Oh, you've no. got to watch it. I won't blow it for you. But there's a scene in there where he gives a monologue that is just, I watched it like 20 times. It's in the middle somewhere. So if you, if you, do you yeah, ever watch Touch well, of Evil? Yeah, of course. Yeah. What a great film. Uh, and so I finally watched it the other night and there's, there's one monologue scene in there that just, it, it's one of those actor moments that'll just blow you like out of, it blew me out of the water. I don't know about you. You've been, you've that been dude, that dude is before. the most amazing. Yeah. But my God, what a tale of not going that way. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, Watching Danny grow and then watching certain people who start like Orson Welles in his early 20s had the world at his feet and was maybe the most talented dude in the, you know, and then and made arguably like the greatest movie of all time in Citizen Kane. And then mm -hmm. at the end, he's barking at people on um, <laughs> trying to direct him in a voiceover commercial for frozen peas and shit. Just oh, yeah, I remember that. Wine and, you know, it's a cautionary <laughs> tale, but. Thank God when Orson Welles was burning bright, like my God, there's nothing yeah, like that, dude. Nothing like him. Yeah. If you get a chance to check out the movie, it's wonderful. I but will. Uh, thank you very much for coming on the show and spending some time with us. We certainly appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. All the best, man. Thank you very much. And to our audience, go check out the book. You can order it up where fine bookstore uh, fine books are sold at fine bookstores. Only go to the fine bookstores uh treo my life of crime redemption and hollywood sounds like you're gonna love it uh judging by the stories and the life of both of you guys i'm sure it's gonna be a fun read check it out guys uh go to youtube.com for just chris Voss. hit the bell notification go to all of our groups on facebook linkedin twitter instagram all this uh tiktok all those different places go see us on goodreads at forward slash chris Voss and all that stuff be good to each other uh we'll see you next time